Are we all doing GSConf? My name is Peter Aiken. Today I'm going to be speaking about deliberate direct positive action. So during the day uh, I work at Litmus where we build something called the Email Creative Platform. Uh, my day job involves looking after a team. We build uh, uh, the app with JavaScript, Rails, in an agile fashion, with, and we all work remotely. Currently, we're hiring. If you would like to, if this sounds interesting, please catch me later. Previously, um, I spent many years organizing Scotland CSS and Scotland JS, and now I focus my community efforts on something called Global Diversity CFP Day, which is going to be the focus of our talk today and what I learned through putting this together. Um, so just to give you an idea of what that is, it's we, on a single day, we host a load of workshops all around the world with the sole aim of supporting and encouraging people from underrepresented and marginalized groups and putting together their first tech conference proposal. The aim thereby being that if more people from these groups apply, then you will see more people with different, coming from different backgrounds, with different experiences and different perspectives, and sharing that on stages like this. So they just, I want to introduce some, some definitions here, because I get a whole lot of questions around two of the, the, the terms in the title of, of the event name. First up, diversity. What we're talking about here is something that is contextually dependent on your location in the world. And, excuse me, it's usually easier to describe who diversity doesn't apply to. And so, in the Western part of the world, uh, the, the people that make up the, the majority of the workforce, the, the privileged group, as I would describe them, are the cis, white, hetero, able-bodied men, like myself. And pretty much if all of those things, cis, white, hetero, able-bodied man, if, if there's any of those that don't apply to an individual, Usually, diversity refers to that individual. Does that make sense? OK. And um, there's another question that I get, or variants of, and when, when any time I'm involved in a diversity and inclusion initiative. And these questions usually come from someone who presents like myself and are along the lines of, uh, can I participate in this event because I think diversity applies to me because um, I work with this really, really obscure database technology. In case you're wondering, folks, no. <laughs> uh, next up, we've, we've got the, the, the acronym CFP. That stands for Call for Proposals. This is effectively a, a, a process that a, a tech conference like this would open to encourage the community to, to come forward to propose topics and share their knowledge and experience. So who is this talk for? Um, as I mentioned, that this, is like, this talks about uh, the, the things that I've learned through organizing this event. And there's going to be things here that will be useful from a, a management perspective. If you are running a diversity and inclusion initiative, perhaps in the workplace, if you um, or maybe wanting to be a better member of the tech community, if you organize meetups, if you organize conferences. So given that all of you are part of the JavaScript community, this talk is very much for you. So our, um, the, the rough order of service, I suppose, today is uh, we'll be talking through where did CFP Day come from, what happens during a workshop, what's involved in organizing a workshop, and through that, there'll be the sort of things that, that I've learned. <coughs> so wh where did Global Diversity CFP Day come from? Um, well, it won't surprise you to discover that this grew out of my experience running the conferences. And I think from about 2013 to 2015, when the call for proposals process was open for those conferences, 
uh, to, to encourage and engage people to, apl and to apply to speak. I, I would host a, a number of like, video, public video call sessions and it was kind of like meet the organizer and some previous speakers. If you've got any questions, you know, let's try and address them and encourage you to apply to speak. And by 2015, I had really no idea how many people from those calls were actually applying um, or making the final lineup. So what, what was this worthwhile? And uh, in 2015, at the after party, after giving, a t giving our talk, Katie Fenn uh, and I were chatting at the after party, and Katie uh, mentioned that the video calls that she attended was just the nudge that she needed to finally put together that first talk proposal. Um, if I remember correctly, uh, Katie, kind of like myself, when it came to trying to, or to doing this kind of thing, Somebody want to say it for me? Procrastination was really good at getting in the way. <laughs> so if we fast forward to 2016, um, again, the CFP was open, and I was trying to figure out a way of, you know, these video calls were useful, but how could we amplify that? How could we do something that was more direct, targeted, positive in terms of supporting people from underrepresented and marginalized groups. And that, that, was, that was a good question, and how do we go about answering it? Um, and and like about three days later, I kind of just like sat up first thing in the morning, and it, the idea just had kind of came to me in my head, and that was the idea of hosting a diversity CFP workshop, and that was specifically to encourage people to apply Scotland GS and Scotland CSS. And so this idea of having a workshop, you know, it was like, what was I doing? I already, you know, I've got a full-time job. I've got a family to look after and, you know, tend to and spend time with. We've got, we had two dogs that were running wild. Um, I was organizing two conferences. Let, let's, let's run a workshop here, yeah, in, in like a couple of weeks' time. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then I sort of started chatting to people. Uh, uh, for, for instance, Katie, who said, you know, as soon as I, I shared this idea, Katie said, can I run one in Sheffield? I was, I was chatting to a friend in Dublin, and it was, oh, we'll run one too. Uh, and this kind of snowballed from having, to, to, to effectively having uh, a workshop in three weeks' time in Glasgow, in Scotland, Edinburgh, Sheffield, Dublin, London, and Berlin. I did literally get in touch with, with Robin from Berlin GS, thinking everybody has just kept saying yes, just for a laugh. What do you think if we got some like this to happen in Berlin? And Robin said, yes. So, Running those workshops, I think it was about 60 people attended, and it had a massive impact on the, the diversity of applicants to the, the, the conferences to speak. And the, the, in terms of the lineup, particularly for Scot Scotland GS, it had a massive, massive impact. Uh, in terms of, so there was about 60 people attended these workshops, um, and there were 17 slots available for that conference, and three people from those workshops were speakers that year. And bearing in mind, there was like 200 applicants to speak. So that, that was just, it, it just validated the idea. But in terms of putting these workshops together, um, I, I wanted everybody to have a, the attendees at each workshop to get a consistent message and set of advice. And to try and make that happen, I wanted to sort of provide that, that, that message, um, but at the same time, you know, because I didn't want six different groups of people trying to put together their own workshop in a really short notice. Um, they're already running about looking for venues and uh, mentors and team members and all this kind of stuff. And so I thought, how can we sort of 
make this a whole lot simpler? How can we boil this down to like a conversation? So I was, I was thinking, could we, how could we make this happen? And I got in touch with Rockbot and Sarah May and asked, is there any chance that the two of you could sort of have some, sort of, that make some time to have a chat and share and discuss things like um, advice around putting together a proposal, like what would you put in the title and the abstract, the description fields, and uh, your experiences of that, the highs and lows of being accepted, being rejected from events. And on the flip side, you know, what, what's your experience of being in review committees, knowing that they both had, had done that kind of thing? Oh, and uh, can you get it to us in the next fortnight, please, in two weeks? And they said yes. <laughs> What's going on? How can we put this burden on so many people? And they just keep on saying yes. And so with those videos, we were able to enable all of the workshops to like the actual material to get, get going a whole lot quicker. And so enable people is the, the first thing to call out there. And so the event was, well, let's see, round about the, the June time in 2016. And come about August time, uh, I had finally sort of, my brain had reconstituted enough that thoughts were forming again. That, that I'm sure the organizers here will uh, attest that doing something like this takes it out of you, and running these types of events. And I was thinking that given the huge impact that we mentioned earlier on Scotland GS, how, how could we, well, it was more like there was nothing in the workshop, there was nothing that was JavaScript specific. There was nothing CSS specific. And there wasn't really anything even Scotland specific, which kind of made me feel a little bit sad in that regard. <laughs> but, you know, let, let, let's turn the frown upside down. You know, could this concept be shared with all tech communities and support all of the people within those communities? Could this be shared with all tech communities everywhere? Which I still struggle. It just seems huge. How, how has this all come to be? Um, so next up, what happens during a workshop? Um, if you come along to attend a workshop, um, th there's a whole host of people so, um, that have are keen to egg you on and make, make this happen for you. I've already mentioned Raquel and Sarah with giving, giving you CFP advice. Danielle will introduce you or help you in crafting your biography. Saron will help you put together your perfect tech talk. Melinda will introduce you to the art of slide design. And Jess, Jess will take you through a whole host of things that are going to happen on the day of your talk um, and how to handle them and some tips around that kind of stuff. And so in amongst that, the mentors in the workshop will be working with you to help identify exactly what it is that you should be proposing a talk about. And you know, later on, there'll be the opportunity to actually start writing that proposal. And ideally, we'll all have prizes if you get that applied to an actual event by the end of the day, which, which might be a bit of a, a challenge and a stretch. Um, okay. And so um, did anybody see Aribas talk on Monday? <laughs> Woohoo! Um, Ariba was talking about um, bullying, teenagers being bullied, and the, the, the assumptions that uh, her team were, had made around trying to support the teenagers. And through talking to the teenagers, uh, they were able to sort of disprove some of those assumptions and get a whole load of better ideas. So this, this totally ties up with my experience at this point, um, to talk to people you don't have all the answers. And in this situation, or in this example, uh, where, where is it? There we go. Uh, Danielle, in the top right there, um, is the CEO of Women Talk Design. They host a whole series of workshops related to encouraging women to, to be speaking and trying to elevate and promote them. Uh, so we have very, very similar goals. And uh, we were having a chat, and Danielle was rapid fire going through all these things that uh, 
they have basically in their back pocket. And to try and see where the holes were in the CFP day curriculum, is there anything that, that we could add? And uh, but when it comes to um, applying to speak, there, there's, there's two things that you'll need to put together. One being your proposal, another one being your biography. And Peter had completely forgotten about the biography bit. <laughs> and that, that, that's why Daniel, Danielle stepped in and uh, put that um, workshop activity together. Um, yeah. So given what you've heard about the, these workshops, if this is something that you feel might be of interest, you might like to dip your toe in the water. There's no commitment necessary. Um, we will be running CFP Day in 2020 in January, February time. And we've got some advice from Ramon <laughs> from his talk as well. Just go for it. <laughs> Next up, what's involved in organizing a workshop? So the first thing that you need to know before you dive in, that this event worldwide is 100% free of charge. We want to ensure that no attendee has to go through any sort of financial barrier or that, that may stop them from participating. These are the t exactly the type of people we're aiming to support. And also, you know, nobody gains financially in terms of the workshop organizers, the team members, myself, nobody financially gains from this event. So what are the actual things that you need to do to be in terms of being an organizer? And th this is the, the sort of list of things that you need to do from a sort of logistical perspective. You need to find a venue. In terms of finding someone to pay for catering, that's kind of optional, but it's, it's really nice if, if you can take care of that and make that happen. Um, because, you know, it's going to keep everybody together in terms of the event during lunch, that sort of thing. Next up, you need to build an awesome team who share our values and mission. You need to promote your workshop. Um, you're going to know your location a whole lot better than Peter will away back in Scotland. Um, you, you're going to know what all the different tech communities are. You're going to know the people to reach out to. You're going to know the best ways to get in touch with each of these communities, be it Slack, be it email lists, meetup.com, whatever it may be. And finally, code of, conduct code of conduct training. Everybody in your workshop team needs to go through this code of conduct training. Attendees will potentially be bringing you issues to deal with, and it's down to you to, to handle those situations. The idea of the training is that you're in the best position possible to handle any eventuality. Um, and, and, and I suppose explain to you how we expect you to handle that situation. So at this point, we've got a number of, sort of lessons learned all lined up. First one, don't be shy. And this is all around finding your venue and, and asking folks to pay for catering. Um, you know, it's like reach out to companies to borrow their, their office at the weekend. And, excuse me, ideally everybody, you know, if we, if we look back at the, the, the original first six workshops, everybody kept saying yes. So please, Bear that in mind and, you know, sort of use that as encouragement to reach out um, if, you're, if you're looking for sponsorship or space. Another thing to bear in mind is that um, when you're reaching out to these companies, there's more than likely somebody in there who has, like, a line item on their list of annual goals. And there'll be an empty checkbox, and it'll say something like, support diversity and inclusion. And it will maybe possibly have a question mark after it. Reach out to them. Think of it like this. But maybe not put it in these terms. <laughs> that, you know, you're helping them by, by taking up their office space as a venue, by accepting funding for catering. You're enabling them to tick that box when it comes to the end of the year when there's a review. You're helping them get a pay rise. Bear that in mind. So ideally, I'm hoping that that will 
encourage you to take those steps forward. Next up, we've got visibility. So this, again, is, is very much in relation to your venue. Um, once you've, you've found a venue and you're going to uh, add all the details to it to the website, there's quite a few questions in the, the access information section. There's about 35 questions in there. Um, and we're covering things like, does, you, does your venue support or have gender neutral bathrooms? Uh, does it have a nursing room? Is there a quiet room? Is there parking nearby? Is it well lit? There's quite a lot, so I'll, I'll hold off just there. Um, but the idea is that we're sharing the information about what your venue has available. Ideally, if it's in an office, it's going to be quite accessible. I, I doubt that it's going to support all the things that we've got questions about. But the whole purpose here is to convey to the potential attendees um, what is available and supported so that they can uh, look, at the, look at this and decide, does this venue support my access requirements? If it doesn't, ideally, they will reach out. And hopefully, the, the organizer will be able to do something to remedy that, which might not be possible, but they can bear it in mind for doing something better that would support people uh, with, with that particular uh, requirement in, in like a, an upcoming year. I would like to give a, a huge shout out to, to Aisha Blake, who looks after our Detroit workshop and has started a whole community around supporting um, newbies in public speaking all year round. And Aisha, from, from her, um, the, the, the events that she's previously been involved in organizing had a, a, a list of access questions, about 20 uh, questions, and, and passed them over. And that was a, a huge start for getting us going. And you know, we're continually adding to them, and we're continually refin refining the, the, the language to make it as inclusive as possible. Thank you, Aisha. Next up, representation matters. So that, this, this feels like a, something that shouldn't need called out to organizers, because really, this is what the whole event's about. We want to have a more, more people from different backgrounds on the tech stage. And ideally, you know, the, the, when, when people from similar backgrounds who generally, up to that point, haven't uh, participated in events like this, when they see people like themselves uh, in the speaking lineup, if they're comfortable enough, hopefully they, they will step forward and start to participate in, in these communities. As an organizer, when putting together your workshop team, please remember representation matters in your team. Um, th there have been cases where there's a group of men, very well intended, making workshops happen, which is great. However, there, there, are, there have been women that have got in touch and said, I'm not going to participate. If anybody's a bit unsure as to why that might be, catch me later for a chat, OK? Um, next up, promote autonomy. So earlier on, we were talking about enabling uh, workshop organizers by providing as much materials and a schedule to get everybody going. When you're putting together your workshop team, you will be pulling in people that, are, that have public speaking experience. You will be pulling in people that have gone through these CFP processes, been accepted and rejected. And they will have a whole load of advice and experience to share around that. If they have time and availability, could they put together a talk or a workshop activity? If they have the time to do that and give the attendees in your workshop something that's even more engaging and memorable as an experience and like an educational um, experience, you are fully empowered to do that. In terms of the materials we supply, you can use as much, all, as little, or none as you see fit, as long as we're all driving towards the same goal. 
if we've piqued your interest, and this is something that you would like to participate in, would you like to organize an event? Um, if there isn't one in your area, um, we'll be opening the, the call for workshop organizers and teams between September and October time. And we would love to have you on board. If you have any questions, feel free to grab me after this. And if there isn't, uh, if, if there's a, already a workshop organizing, being organized. <laughs> um, you know, the, the, the team's details will be on that workshop page. You will be able to get in touch with them and reach out and offer to, to join in. And everybody has always been very welcome and uh, keen to just bring everybody in. Code of conduct. Let's see. Today, this section, I'm going to talk about a very specific aspect around the CFPD code of conduct. So, in 2018, um, this is what the page, or a section of the page, looked like. And at the bottom, you can see we've got the global code of conduct team, which is myself and Kim. And I suppose the TLDR for the purposes of this section that you need to be aware of in terms of the code of conduct is that if there's an issue that happens within the workshop, ideally the team will be remedying that within the workshop, with one exception, and that's if there's an issue reported with the organizer. In that instance, the reporter should be, where is it going? See that lovely big orange button there? Um, if the, the, the person wanting to report the issue presses that button and sends an email to the team, we then handle that and address the issue with the organizer. And so there was something, well, uh, well I should explain a little bit first. So there was no inc incidents of this kind during the event. However, in the latter half of 2018, we we received a number of uh, complaints about a small handful of organizers. And I'm not really going to go into that too much, but it's more about how the people got in touch. So we put this shared inbox together, and nobody used it. Everybody got in touch privately through Kim's DMs, which suggested to me that everybody either had some sort of affinity with Kim or trusted her. And in that situation, was it that they trusted Kim and didn't trust me? Or just that they trusted her more than they trusted me? I don't know. And in 2018, we were very much trying to make the team bigger and more representative, but that didn't quite work out as we'd hoped, um, because we're keeping asking people to do more and more things um, and adding to people's workload. Uh, so by 2019, we had more people involved and engaged. Uh, that picture down at the bottom is right off the bo bottom of everybody's screen when they come to visit the page. And any issues that we've received since have came through that shared inbox. So the thing that I would call out there is that a cis, a, as a cis, white, hetero, able-bodied man, the most marginalized in our communities may not trust me. If you're an event organizer, or you're running some sort of initiative in the workplace, please bear in mind that as a cis, white, hetero, able-bodied man, the most marginalized in our communities may not trust you. We hear the term people from underrepresented and marginalized groups a lot. These two things go hand in hand, but what's the difference? White women are underrepresented in tech. They're not marginalized. People of color, particularly women of color, 
are marginalized. Members of the trans community are marginalized. With that in mind, as a cis, white, hetero, able-bodied person, the most marginalized in our communities may not trust you. If this is something that you would like to learn more about, um, I would recommend following Kim Creighton. Kim will be sharing her lived experience online and does. Um, and I would highly recommend, you know, if anything I have said in the last few minutes has made you perhaps uncomfortable, I, I would suggest just sitting with that rather than having perhaps an emotional or defensive reaction to that and just try and figure out why. And so Kim shares her perspective and continually makes everybody aware that she will be making you feel uncomfortable by, I suppose, yeah, sharing her experience as a black woman. I would also like to point you to Julian's talk from Monday. Um, I thought that was an amazing talk, introducing us to a whole load of scenarios and terminology that we might not have been aware of. Um, if you haven't seen Julian's talk, please catch the video. And so bearing all of this in mind, um, there are people who have raised issues and sent them in to our shared uh, global code of conduct email account. If I wind back just a little bit. What if there's people that haven't got in touch because that picture's on there? We want to support the most marginalized in our communities because we know that they are actively harmed every day in big and small ways, intentionally and not. And for that reason, I am gonna be stepping out of this team to let the people who have similar lived experiences to the people we are aiming to support uh, handle those. And ideally, just by trying to be transparent and list all the people there. If I am in any way pro proven to be a barrier to that, um, I'm gonna step out of that. So the next thing to call out, regard you hear lots of people with lots of good intentions. There's people writing lots of blog posts about diversity, inclusion, be it in the community, be it in the workplace or companies. That's lovely. But for, the, for change to happen, there needs to be action. If there is no action, good intentions and talk, it just really doesn't count for anything. So, just in summary, uh, to, just to give you some stats around the, the events themselves, in February 2018, we had 53 workshops all around the world supporting over 1,000 people who attended. In 2019, we had, over 80, well, we had 81 workshops, over 360 volunteers making this happen for over 2,000 attendees. At this point, I would like to ask anybody in the room who was involved and organizing or mentoring or facilitating at one of these events. Could you come up and join me, please? Come on, Ramon. <laughs> and while folks are making their way here, I'd like to introduce you to our Boston workshop this year. 
This is the, the folks from our workshop in Nablus and Palestine. Glasgow, Scotland. And a very enthusiastic bunch in Johannesburg in South Africa. Whoops. <laughs> At this point, could you please give all of these people a huge, huge round of applause for making this happen? I cannot thank you all enough. And uh, I'm going to keep you here for a bit longer, sorry. It's just for effect. Um, so th the people that we've not really heard from or, or talked specifically about are the people who have came through this event and went on to become speakers. And this is just a small group of the people that have done that. And when we look at social media, we, we, we hear things, like when we're talking about diversity and inclusion, it's, we hear things like um, diversity will bring us, will, will help make our products better, our teams better, our events better, by, by bringing a whole lot of new uh, experiences and, and um, yeah, experiences and perspectives. But we never really hear of like sort of concrete examples of how that's happened. So I'd like to introduce you to Suze. Suze attended our London workshop this year. Um, about a month later, gave a talk, which was all about her experience of changing career from working in the Metropolitan Police Force to becoming a programmer. And I, I know, having looked at YouTube, this is in the thousands and upon thousands of views already. And the thing that I want to say there is that, as a cis white hetero able bodied man, that's not a talk that I could give. I'm sure there's some men that could, and I'm sure there's some that might attempt to bluff their way through it. But if that's the case, let's see how you might feel about Benedict's talk. So Benedict's up in the top right here, and she attended our Oslo workshop. Benedict's talk's all about her side project, which is a web-based, privacy-first, media tracker. This is something that I am in no way qualified to talk about. I'm not even going to, I could not attempt to, yeah, ignorance, you know, abound. Um, this group, let's see. Tech has come a long way in the last couple of years in terms of diversity and inclusion but it has such a long way to go. Our society, our world, to achieve any level, serious level of equality, really needs to change. These are just some of the people taking that step forward, a very brave step forward, putting themselves out there to make that change happen. They are the role models for the people that come after them. Yes, by becoming a tech speaker, you, you, th there will be d benefits to, to each of these people individually. There will be opportunities for travel. There, there will be better networking opportunities, which can lead to you know, better career opportunities. Yes, it benefits them individually. However, collectively, they are all enriching all of us. And it only seems appropriate for someone who's been through this process to close out this talk. I would like to welcome Ariba Jaha. Hi. I think some of you uh, might have seen me here yesterday. Um, so as an immigrant woman of color with a disability who switched careers from biomechanical engineering to product and tech, there's not a lot of rooms where I could just walk in and automatically feel a sense of belonging. But I did at Global CFP Day. 
Um, when I first became interested or curious about speaking, there weren't many resources available that easily walk through how did people figure this out? Where did they find the opportunity? How did they craft an idea? How did they design a talk? How did they show up on stage? It somehow felt like there was a group of people that just knew how to do all the things, and then there was the rest of us. And, um, and I think uh, Global CFP Day was the first resource and community that I discovered that felt very accessible and made for people like me, where it was OK to just not know what to do and, and know that we could all collectively figure it out together. So that experience started a journey in me, journey for me, that eventually got me to this stage yesterday. That was my first talk. And I couldn't have done it without having that community to show up at, to feel like, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm hoping someone can help me. Um, so if you're in the audience today and you think that you don't have anything to share, I want you to know someone needs to hear your story. You know, um, even if the talk subject has been shared before, your lens and your experience with that has to be shared. So find your local CFP chapter and um, learn with them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers.